welcome everyone. It's so nice to see so many of you here tonight. Um, my name is Dr. Alyssa Travers, and I'm one of the psychologists here at the Lurie Center. And I'm really excited to talk to you about a topic that's near and dear to me, um, the, fem the female phenotype, or sometimes we call it subtype of autism spectrum disorder, or ASD. So my goal for tonight is to kind of section this off into three pieces of discussion. First, we'll, we'll talk about how autism manifests in cisgender females. I'll uh, talk through terminology in just a minute. Secondly, we'll talk through some recent trends that we're seeing in research as well as diagnosis. And third, we'll talk together about current resources and supports for girls and women on the spectrum. So I'll be periodically looking at the chat throughout the talk this evening. Um, please feel free to type questions throughout the presentation. I'll again take some pauses throughout just to see if there are any clarifying questions that I can answer. And then we'll likely get to the bulk of the questions at the end of the slides, if that makes sense. Okay, all right. Just having a little, okay, there we go. All right, so we'll start off with some basic statistics. So according to this year's statistics from the CDC, we now know that approximately one in 36 individuals is diagnosed with autism. And you'll hear me um, predominantly use um, uh, language like autistic um, autistic individual throughout um, the uh, presentation. We currently view the male to female ratio to be approximately four males to every female, although some may argue that the ratio is actually a bit smaller, just something to, to think about and digest. Okay. So we know that the autism spectrum is quite large. And what we found so far in research is there, there doesn't seem to be major sex or gender differences among nonverbal individuals with autism who have more limited language and or more limited cognition or intellectual skills. What we have found is that there are mixed findings regarding gender differences among those individuals with ASD that are verbal, okay? A recent study in 2020 showed that people who do not identify with the sex that they were assigned at birth are three to six times more likely than cisgender people. And that just means people who identify as the same sex in which they were born then um, and non um, individuals who don't identify with their sex at birth are three to six more times likely than individuals who do to be autistic. And then kind of the, the converse of that, gender diverse individuals are more likely to report autistic traits and maybe wonder if they have undiagnosed ASD than other individuals in the population. So um, the recent the research here is quite new. Um, and we often tend to have a coffee conversation that solely focuses on gender identity because it's such a nuanced topic. So today I'll be presenting to you what we know about the female subtype of autism for cisgender females, those who identify with the same sex in which they were born. And anecdotally, it's important to note that um, some non-binary individuals, as well as those who do not identify with the sex they were assigned at birth, um, have endorsed and kind of said, I think that I meet um, some criteria of this subtype of ASD as well. So the female subtype of ASD was formally discussed in 2015, about eight years 
or so ago. Um, but some historical literature has recently come out and said, actually, people began talking about it in the 70s and 80s. It just wasn't as mainstream as, as has it's become over the past eight to 10 years. So the female phenotype of ASD um, kind of takes a different lens when looking at the classic criteria of autism. So there's two, as we know, two different types of criteria for autism, social interaction and communication skills, as well as restricted interests and repetitive behaviors. So in terms of social interaction and communication skills, researchers found that some females on the spectrum may show a greater desire, so more social, inter um, social motivation to interact with others than we might expect or compared to their male counterparts. They may show increased language skills. They may have developed some close friendships that we might not necessarily um, expect if we're thinking about the autism stereotype. Um, some females may show a greater tendency to kind of imitate or mimic others during social interactions, which can lead to camouflaging and compensation, which we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. Some females may also show a greater tendency for creative or fantasy play than maybe we may have thought. When we peel back the layers sometimes though, we can see that it can be based on or scripted off of maybe a book or a TV show or movie. But on the surface, it, it can look quite creative and may throw people off when thinking about um, traditional conceptions of autism. The second category, restricted interests and repetitive behaviors. Many of us were trained to kind of think about um, kind of classic autistic interests being perhaps inanimate objects, right? So um, fans, cars, Thomas the Train, et cetera, et cetera. But what this research has found on females is their interests or, or passions is sometimes what I like to call it, um, may involve people. So, you know, greater interest in celebrities or, you know, one to two celebrities. Um, I see a lot of females who have a great passion for animals or particular genres of books. Some females might show perfectionistic tendencies, right? Wanting to do an assignment just right, wanting to follow the rules just right, right? And that's how that kind of rigidity might play out for them. We can also sometimes see restrictive eating or eating disorders within this population as well um, due to some of the rigid thinking patterns as well as sensory sensitivities, right? That can come along with an autistic profile. Okay, so I'm just going to pause and check to see if anything came up on the, um, on the chat. If you're going to chat, please chat it to everyone so everyone can see the question. That would be great. I know you all can't see me on the screen. Um, I'm not quite sure how to fix that. So if it's okay with you, I'm just going to keep moving so that we don't lose um, time with me trying to figure that out. Okay. So, so that's the diagnostic criteria in terms of how females on the spectrum may differ than their male, male counterparts. There's also been some research looking at kind of are there gender differences in other skills among autistic ind individuals? So there was a study, this one was probably maybe five or six years ago at this point, that looked at children and adolescents from about seven to 18 or so years old. And their parents rated them on both their executive functioning skills and their adaptive, or sometimes I call that life skills. And what the study showed was that um, the parents rated females to have greater difficulty with planning and organizational skills, working memory. So that's just brief attention. So if I said, you know, hey, don't forget your bag and turn off the light, right? You use your working memory to hold those two things in mind, as well as impulse control. So your ability to kind of stop and think before acting. So again, parents rated autistic girls and teens to have greater difficulty compared to autistic boys. 
There is also a gender difference. There's also a gender difference in terms of adaptive skills. So we break up adaptive skills as per particular questionnaire looked at them in terms of communication skills, daily living skills, and then socialization. So there weren't any gender differences with communication or socialization, um, but there were with daily living skills. So parents really um, reported autistic girls to have more difficulty with self-care. So that would include things like personal hygiene, grooming, things like that. Household tasks, kind of helping around the house, as well as community navigation. So kind of, you know, understanding how to use money, how to use public transportation, right? Being safe in the community. So this was one of the first studies kind of looking at how do some of these other skills manifest differently across the genders. And when I read this study, and I'm still curious about it, the authors didn't comment on it. I um, am wondering about the role of gender roles, right? So just by the nature of us kind of living in the U.S. and living in today's society, do we have different expectations for girls, autistic or not, and different than we have for boys, right? And does that kind of play into how parents rated some of these skills? So for example, the parents rated the um, autistic girls to have more difficulty with hygiene. Is it a true skill deficit or is it that our expectations for female hygiene may look a little bit different than our male expectations? Or is it that females may also have some additional things to manage, right, with the onset of a menstrual cycle? I don't know the answer um, to that, but that's just a thought that I had when I was kind of digesting the research myself. Hey, I'm just going to um, answer a clarifying question. It says, are these studies a comparison to autistic boys or non-autistic girls? So the two groups that we that they compared, so parents were rating their autistic daughters versus their the autistic sons. Okay, so the, the girl, the the um, points that you see on the screen, the autistic girls were rated to have more difficulty in developing these skills compared to the sample of autistic boys. So again, we don't know, is this a true skill deficit? Is it um, due to, again, different expectations for girls and boys in general? Or is it more of a both and, right? Hard to know and just something interesting to think about. Thank you for that question. There's also, you know, been some additional thoughts about, are there other aspects that are kind of different in the experience of autistic males versus autistic females? One that comes to mind, and I'll be honest, there's no, there's no formal research backing this up, but myself as a clinician, this is a topic that I've, that I've been wondering about for many years. So it's, it's this idea of interoception and it comes from um, occupational therapy. And the definition you can see on the slide says it's a sense of physiological sensation in the body, right? So you can see with this slide here, inter interoception can involve anything from us being able to notice our own breathing or kind of our heart beating within our chest. It can help us notice pain if we're hungry, if we're thirsty, if we're feeling pain, if how kind of emotions like anxiety and embarrassment um, manifest physically in our body. Oftentimes, um, interoception can be a challenging skill for autistic individuals to develop in general, right? I often hear clinically this come up in my conversations more often with females than with males on the spectrum. So kind of um, parents of autistic females saying, you know, it's always been hard for her to know when she's hungry or when she's thirsty. It's always been hard for her to be able to, to detect when she needs to use the restroom. We're always running to the restroom at the last minute. You know, um, that's, that's a concern that we're trying to kind of manage and develop for her. So again, I don't know, right? 
um, if this is a true gender difference, but this is something anecdotally that I've seen with many of the, the females that I work with, that this is, this tends to be, um, a concern or a skill that needs some additional support to develop. And I'll pause here to see if there are any questions or thoughts to add. So oh, I did miss a question in the chat from all the earlier. Do autistic girls have better theory of mind? I'm thinking because of camouflaging. Um, I'm actually, I'm not aware if there has been a specific study comparing theory of mind, but that's actually a wonderful segue to what I can share with you in terms of what the research says about camouflaging. So let me transition there. And again, if people have um, additional questions or thoughts, please keep um, typing them in the chat. That's the best way for me to see them. So in addition to, to identifying kind of what are the core characteristics that might um, set apart this female subtype of ASD compared to our kind of classic conceptualization of autism, there's also been a fair amount of research over the past few years, you can see this was published in 2020, about the role of camouflaging. So um, camouflaging refers to um, anything that someone might do to mimic or imitate within a social interaction. So it might be um, trying to match, if you can kind of see me talking with my hands, kind of match using similar body language. So kind of using one's hands, being able to kind of match someone's eye contact or facial expression. Camouflaging might also manifest as like kind of if sit, you're sitting in a group and you notice somebody's laughing at a joke, right? You have no idea what the joke is saying, but you notice other people are laughing. So you know, oh, maybe I should laugh too. So you laugh as well, right? Those are examples of camouflaging. I'm just gonna, a bunch of questions popped in. Yes, okay, so I'll get, I'll get to resources towards the end. Okay. So, we're not quite sure yet um, whether these differences that I've talked about and the, the core symptoms of ASD or the executive functioning or adaptive skills, um, I'm not aware of any studies that are looking at, that have yet looked at adult autistic men and women and compared. I think the research is still quite young here and there's a lot of opportunity. What I am seeing more with um, in terms of the studies of autistic women, which I think is wonderful, is researchers really taking a narrative approach and really trying to understand what has the lived experience been of autistic females, especially those that were better late diagnosed. So I'll talk about that in just a minute, but I do do think that this is a kind of a um, a good opportunity for us to be able to follow these kind of strands of ASD across the lifespan? And unfortunately, we just don't yet have the hard data to, to tell us how, how these things manifest over life. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about camouflaging. So I'm just gonna say this question out loud to try to use my working memory to, re to remember it. Um, how do we as parents recognize camouflaging? I think that's a great question. So let's talk a little bit more about camouflaging and then we'll swing back to that. So again, um, camouflaging is again, this mimic, mimicking behavior, trying to mimic nonverbals, trying to mimic eye contact, mimic laughing, right? Trying to kind of do the right thing. And what, actually, let me come back here. 
there's another concept that I wanted to mention. So that's, there's kind of in their, their nuance, like it's hard, it's, they, they overlap. So there's this idea of camouflaging and there's this idea of compensation or using compensatory strategies. So somebody might realize that they have, um, greater difficulties, right? Picking up on social cues, or they've been taught that. And they might be motivated to say like, well, I want to figure out how do I live in the social world? So they might develop some strategies in addition to mimicking that could help them with this. So for example, they might develop some cues that um, help them learn, okay, when somebody furrows their brow or when somebody, you know, does this with their face, that means that they're feeling X. So then I need to act this way. So kind of developing a system to kind of take in the social information to then figure out how do I decode it and what do I do with it? So going back to this question of, um, how do we know someone is camouflaging? These studies that have looked at um, these experiences of, um, that's a great question, Steve, that I'll, I'll tack that on in a minute. Um, can you comment on dysregulated and aggressive behavior resulting from camouflaging or masking? Yes, that's great. Um, what this kind of arm of uh, studies of adult women have found that this, this camouflaging, although on the outside, it, it looks like the person is, you know, functioning just as maybe someone sitting next to them, right? Who might not have some of these difficulties, right? On the outside, things look fine, quote unquote, fine. But on the inside, one is putting in so much internal energy to try to decode, to try to stick with things, to try to look, quote unquote, with it or typical or whatever word we want to put in there, right? And in these interviews of autistic women kind of saying, what has your experience been like? They've kind of linked camouflaging to, to having a serious impact on their mental health. So kind of showing psychological distress, you know, depression, anxiety, and just having trouble kind of functioning in the day to the day, because not only are they trying to kind of go about what they have to do at school, go about what they have to do at work, but they're also kind of simultaneously running this kind of camouflaging or compensatory strategy, you know, process within their brain at the same time. Right. And often find times we find, um, Steve, related to your question, that there are a lot of mental costs of this masking and camouflaging, which um, some people have started to talk about with the phrase autistic burnout. Right. Some of you may use the phrase, some of you may self identify with this phrase. Right. And a lot of the females that I work with, you know, work really hard throughout the school day, really hard throughout the work day and need a lot of time to decompress at the end of the day. If they don't get the right supports during the day or they don't allot themselves to take breaks during the day to be able to decompress. And if they don't get that time to be able to decompress and just relax and take that extra layer out of their brain, Sure, I've seen that re, um, that be linked for some females to um, just general dysregulation, right? Which can look like verbal or physical aggression, right? Every person is different. Um, if there is aggression present, I'm just looking at the next question that comes in. Does that mean they have a co-occurring mental condition, um, mental health condition? Maybe, sometimes. Sometimes not. Sometimes it can be contextual and be explained due to, again, this taxing process that they're doing throughout the day. So kind of linking back to that first question, you know, what do we do? How do we know um, someone is camouflaging? I think, you know, what can be helpful is talking to your child and seeing, you know, if they, if they, um, if they feel very tired at the end of the day, what are they expending their energy on? Are they having um, trouble listening in class? Is it more related to attention? Are they having trouble keeping up with the social interactions? If so, what are they doing? What are they thinking about? And making sure that they have these times to be able to kind of decompress and take off that hat 
to be able to recharge their battery, right? And be able to, to go back out there the next day or really kind of help them prioritize. What am I going to spend social energy on today versus tomorrow? What are, what are my goals here? Um, all right, before I move on, I'm just going to address one more question. How do you compare camouflaging and masking? Um, I personally kind of view them synonymously. Um, I, I could be wrong. Um, so if somebody else has some more information on that, just let me know. And masking, um, I have seen in the literature and in person and um, personal experience, it can be very conscious how I'm describing it, or it can also be unconscious as well. Um, Um, I'm going to address one more question before I move on to this next chunk where we kind of talk about the um, assessment process. So this next question um, comes from Amanda. Oh, actually, that one just popped in. Okay, let me see if I can answer them jointly. How can we teach autistic daughters to recognize when they are camouflaging and what support should schools have to help with this? Are there professional development efforts that are helping special educators understand how females present differently and maybe camouflaging? Yes. So there are um, a lot of great resources that have been developed over the past couple of years. When we get to the resource slide, I'll highlight um, a particular book that I think it would be, is really, really helpful um, that you could share um, not only as a parent to school staff as you're collaborating with your school team, but also if you're a professional, um, whether you're a clinician or a teacher or an allied um, you know, professional yourself, it would be very helpful to kind of read together um, with a set of colleagues. So I'm going to make sure um, I highlight that book when we get there. All right, so let's talk about, so we talked about the female phenotype, we've kind of talked about how it manifests, we talked about some of the costs, right, of, of these aspects of the pheno, um, the pheno, female phenotype. So let's talk a little bit about assessment, right? So we know that um, the way we've traditionally conceptualized autism and the way in which we've traditionally developed our tools to assess for autism have been based on the cisgender male population, right? And when we think about barriers to diagnosis, and there's kind of, you know, a no blame game here, right? There are a lot of different factors that can present as barriers for our females. So there may be, there can be kind of individual factors about the female, which I kind of alluded to. Um, females may show a lot of social strengths because of their camouflaging and they might not kind of fit our, talking about kind of like the global R or we, our conception of what we, we have thought autism is. That can kind of lead into some interpersonal factors, right? About our kind of um, family or school beliefs about autism, right? And whether or not that kind of fits what we've been taught. And there are also system level factors, which I'll focus on today. Um, maybe we're, we tend to focus more on some of the, what we would call externalizing behaviors that we see, maybe some mental health challenges that we see. And we tend to kind of hone in and try to treat those and kind of miss some more of the subtle symptoms of the female presentation. And again, there's also um, some limitations to our diagnostic tools, which I'll share with you um, right now. So these are, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with these tools. Um, these are the, the main diagnostic, kind of what we would say, like the gold, quote unquote, gold standard tools um, for assessing autism. So some of them are questionnaires, some of them are hybrid questionnaires and more interactive assessment. And the ADOS, the first one listed here, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, it's more kind of a play-based interactive assessment for autism. And we know that um, many of these tools, especially the first two, the ADOS and the SCQ, um, have, were developed based on these male, kind of cisgender male ideas for autism. So for example, um, in the ADOS, um, 
people get, um, you get a lot of points or, or not a lot of points for your nonverbal communication. So your eye contact, your facial expressions, how well your facial expressions are linked to your, um, your verbalizations like I'm doing right now, right? And we know with camouflaging, um, a lot of our autistic females can learn how to do that. So they may kind of pass that section of the test and not get the points that they need for the autism diagnosis. The SCQ, um, as well as the ADIR, are um, kind of gold standard interviews that we may do to assess for autism. And we know how some of those questionnaires were developed is when we, for example, when we ask about things like um, kind of hyper-focused interest, or again, sometimes I call them passions, some of the examples that they would give parents are, again, more related to those kind of more classic autism symptoms that we see in, on cisgender males, right, with the fans and the trains and the cars. So we might miss things, right, like the celebrities or animal interests that we talked about a few minutes ago. So over time, we've become more aware of um, the, the gender bias that we have in these quote unquote gold standard tools that we have. I will say just as a clinician, um, the third one down, the GARS, tends to be more inclusive of the female phenotype of ASD. What I like about it is, and if some of you have, have used that tool or have you know um, completed the tool yourself, um, the, the um, list a lot more kind of aspects about um, an autistic profile than just kind of focusing on interests and social skills. Um, there are specific sections that look at kind of cognitive rigidity or flexibility, kind of your ability to, to um, adjust and adapt to, you know, what life throws at you, as well as um, just kind of um, emotion regulation, being able to kind of control um emotions or um, handle frustration or everyday setbacks. And I tend to find that um, females on the spectrum kind of, um, they tend to, to show some of those symptoms in that area, which helps to, to detect, you know, the overall autism profile. So a couple of questions here that are perfect segues to my next slide. So the first one is, are there um, diagnostic tools for suspected autism in older adults? And number two, the ADOS is designed for younger people. Is there any move to adapt or change it to diagnose um, adults, male or female? So we can actually use the ADOS um, all the way through adulthood. Um, but, but again, with this growing understanding of this potential male bias with our diagnostic tools, there, there have actually, there's actually been some movement again over the past eight to 10 years to specifically develop female diagnostic tools um, to detect autism, as well as to kind of tweak our current tools um, that we use as clinicians. So I'll share with you on the next slide, just a couple of examples, as well as some of the limitations. And I, there's a lot of tools out there. Um, and if you're looking at tools, I would suggest um, that you focus on those that are, are research backed. So these two that I've selected, there is, um, they're, they're relatively new and there is a body of literature out there backing that they can detect autistic symptoms among females. And they're not just giving us, in other words, a false positive, right? Um, um, diagnosing autism among females who really don't meet the female subtype, if that makes sense. So this first one here on the left is, um, the acronym is called the CAT-Q. Um, it's called the Camouflaging Autistic Traits Questionnaire. That's a really good um, questionnaire to kind of look at what's the cognitive load, like how much energy is someone putting into um, camouflaging and masking in everyday life. So it's, um, it's um, designed for individuals ages 16 and 16 plus, so that's the limitation. There isn't yet any research um, for individuals kind of in those younger teen years. Um, but if you're a parent, it's, it's widely available on the internet. It is research-backed. And if you want to start having conversations with um, your children about, you know, is masking going on? Like, how are you doing? You might use it just as a jumping off point. Again, not it's not going to be a diagnostic tool, but it could just help you kind of start the conversation. The second one, this one I think is, is um, 
I, I use this one less um, often, but it's the girls questionnaire for autism spectrum condition. It was out of the UK. So that's sometimes how they, they term autism. Um, and this one is for individuals 18 plus. So again, there's been this response among researchers to develop better diagnostic tools for these autistic women who we have missed. There's still room to grow and extending them down into the younger years, if that makes sense. But again, if this is of interest to you and you want to start having conversations with your children among camouflaging and masking, I check out the cat cue. The website's like pretty neat. It's like, it's pretty like visually nice to look at. So it might be appealing to talk about with your teen just to start having some conversations um, and maybe, you know, bring up to their clinician or school staff. So before I um, transition, I'll pause here and address a couple of questions. So how do we find a diagnostician for autism? So um, of course, if you are, you know, a current Larry Center patient, um, we have diagnosticians on staff. So our psychologists see um, current patients at the Lurie Center who are referred to us by their Lurie Center physician. That being said, if you are not part of um, the, you're not a Lurie Center patient, um, I would greatly recommend, and I'm going to, I'm going to say, they just changed the name. The acronym is AANE, which many of you I'm sure are very well aware of. It used to be, they used to be called the Autism Asperger's Network, but they just changed their name. So their new name is the Association for Autism and Neurodiversity. They're based out of Watertown, but they're really a national like treasure. Um, we're so lucky to have them. AANE, so it's AANE.org, um, has their own diagnostician directory that you can search and kind of see what people specialize in and contact them Um you know, they all their contact information is listed. You also um, are able to have a free, anyone can have a free um, consultation phone call with AANE staff to get a recommendation for someone in your area as well. Those are great questions. Oh, thank you for posting that in the chat. Somebody just posted AANE in the chat. So if you want to look at that and bookmark it, you can do it from the chat. How are we doing on time? Okay. All right, so now let's move into resources. So um, as Anne as Anne said, um, I believe I read on the slides, so we're of course recording. Um, this, these slides will be available to you in a few weeks. Um, so I have, you can either kind of screenshot some things now, or again, wait for the slides to, to pop in your inbox in a few weeks. Um, I have a selection of books. Um, if you just want to peruse a publisher, I would suggest um, Jessica, let me just type this in the chat, Jessica Kingsley Publishers. They're out of the UK. They're great. Um, they're really on the cutting edge of understanding the female phenotype in terms of providing resources as well as just neurodiversity in general. I, I love um, their website and resources. So that would be a great place to look. Um, I want to go to that question. So there are some books here. I wanted to go to that question about professional resources. Um, these two, he, oops, these two here on the bottom. So a guide to mental health issues and girls and young women on the spectrum, working with girls and young women with an autism spectrum condition, a practical guide for clinicians. Those are two great books that I would recommend um, not only for parents, but also for clinicians, whether you work at a school or not. Those could be great jumping off points um, for resources and in conversations among your team. I have just some you know, additional um, media here. Again, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because I want to open it up for questions and you'll have access to these. And then just some of our programs. So again, I have here the Association for Autism and Neurodiversity, A&E. They're really, um, they're really where it's at in terms of providing support groups and resources and kind of knowing who the expert diagnosticians are in the area. So they're often my first um, 
uh, stop shop. We also co-located with the Lurie Center. We also have our MGH Aspire program that often runs um, girls and, and women-specific therapeutic groups for social skills and building social connections. Um, what you'll also see a and &E would be a great resource to get a read on this, but looking for other resources in your area in terms of just social groups, social support groups. What I'm finding is many um, social skill organizations and practices have over the past at least five years or so, uh, maybe more, have really seen the need to specifically serve autistic females um, and um, have started to develop uh, gender specific groups and, and, um, kind of affinity groups in those areas. So, um, you know, you know A&E would be your, your best stop to kind of looking at, um, kind of getting a, a broader lay of the land there. Okay. So I'm going to pause here and just look at some questions. Oh, that's great. Okay, so the last um, one in the chat here is Sarah was saying, yes, there is an article um, that was published that has um, some more information about gender differences in autism, as well as some of the resources. So thank you for sharing that, Sarah. If you're interested, you can click on it and bookmark it for later. Let me go back to some other questions. Um, and please feel free to keep um, chatting as we're talking. Um, is masking always negative? Is a person aware of what they're doing? Um, this is a great question. Um, I don't, I think really, if we kind of zoom out and think about it, there are really pros and cons in terms of any action or any skill that we do, right? I think by and by, the, the, the research in the literature has chosen to focus on the costs of masking because the costs can be um, quite significant. And I think masking is probably something that we all do as we try to navigate a social situation to get our needs met, right, to meet a particular goal. So I, I think it's much more nuanced than that. I think that's a, that's a really good point there. So how do we know if a female has social anxiety versus social issues related to autism? That's a great question. Um, how I tend to think about things is, you know, um, autism and social anxiety can, can both overlap, right, and show some, re and um, lead to some difficulties in our social relationships right? How we differentiate autism is that um, although there's likely some anxiety related to social interactions, with a diagnosis of autism, there still is this core challenge, this core deficit, kind of whatever language, this core vulnerability, whatever we want to say, with social skills. Whereas with somebody that just has social anxiety, the social skills are there, it's just the anxiety is covering it up. So once we treat the anxiety, we see that the social skills and the social capabilities are there. So sometimes to try to figure out, like, to differentiate between the two, we suggest treating the anxiety first, peeling back that layer, and then seeing what is still there, right? If the skills are there, and it's really just about building confidence, it's more related to the social anxiety versus if there are still some core issues, understanding social cues or understanding sarcasm or kind of reading the room as to what's going on, then oftentimes there is an autistic profile there as well. I hope that answers the question. Okay. I'm, oh my goodness. Okay. I didn't realize all these that came in. Okay. So I'm going to open, I'm going to try to enlarge my chat a little bit. So I can read through them and see if we might be able to link a couple together. Okay. Okay, so I'm seeing a lot of, um, oh, I just want to, Yep. So a comment is a positive aspect of masking. This is a good point is that can show, um, 
you know, under the understanding of perspective, right? Um, I think that's a, that's a good point there. Um, okay, so a core a core kind of question comment I'm seeing concern that I'm seeing is, um, I'll just read the first one. I'm worried that school won't see a need to support her with camouflaging since the following part happens at home. Um, as you can see um, through the comments that came after this, um, you are not alone. This is something that I very frequently see in my clinical practice. She's holding it together so hard during the day. She's getting A's, her binders organized, she's doing drama after school, and then she falls apart as soon as she gets home, right? The cognitive load of the mask is just too much, right? So you know, it, it really depends, next steps really depend, right, on a variety of different factors. But if there is a school team involved, a school IEP team involved, um, I think it would be really important to hold a team meeting to talk about the home school connect, or in this case, disconnect, right? And the school's responsibility and, and kind of partnering, I guess, um, a more neutral way of saying it would be the school's partnering with you um, to help generalize skills from one setting to the next, right? To kind of help us see growth and development for the child across settings. Because historically, we know that it's more challenging for an autistic individual to be consistent with their skill development across settings, right? So by talking about what's going on in the home environment, that might allow you to open things up, to have conversations about What's the masking that's happening in school, right? And how do we build in supports for your child so they get that recharge, they get what they need so that they're kind of not sliding when they get home, right? They kind of have these breaks throughout the day to recharge so you're not seeing that major dip when you get home. And that's going to be different for every child, right? For some children or teens or you know college students or whatever, um, um, okay. Um, I'm sorry. I'm just getting a little distracted from the chat. So I'm going to minimize, I'm not showing good divided attention here. So I'm going to minimize the chat for a second so I can um, finish my thought. So for some students that might mean like, okay, I need to eat lunch in a quiet place. Um, I need that time to decompress. I can't take in the social stimulation. I can't take in the sensory stimulation. Just need to kind of read my book, decompress. And then that gives me what I need to be able to finish out my day. And then I feel more even when I come home, right? We kind of pick and choose and prioritize the social opportunities and the social demands during the day, right? That could also take shape into to other accommodations that are built in, right? Whether it's accommodations for group projects or participating in class or taking breaks as needed um, during class. So it can can lead to, to, you know, different types of supports and accommodations, depending on the individual case of the student. But I think the first thing to do would be um, take some data, right? And kind of show the school team, this is what you're seeing at school. This is what we're seeing at home. And we want to partner with you so that, you know, we can help our child be the best that she can be across all of these environments. And maybe even throwing in, um, that resource, right, for clinicians, that could be a really helpful um, piece of kind of quote unquote research to cite to back up your argument. Okay. All right, I'm just gonna scroll up here. I'm just gonna check the time. Okay, so we have 10 minutes left. Okay, a lot of things have come in. So let me check here. Okay, somebody's mentioning a book, Unmasking Autism, if you wanna add that to your list. Up oh, another, I'm just going to call out the, the um, resources that I see while we're on that topic. Um, Australia and the UK, I must say, have also amazing resources. So somebody's talking about yellow ladybugs. Um, I'm not familiar with an organization in the US that's similar. Um, if there is one, AANE is going to know about it. Um, there's also a really, if you have... Um, younger girls, there's also a really amazing school in the UK. It's called the Limpsfield Grange School. 
Their girls have developed YouTube videos and they've also written graphic novels for other autistic girls as part of their school projects. So if you have kind of an elementary, even middle school girl, um, that might be a good resource for you. I'll put that in here. It's actually in the, um, in the resource section here. Yes, and everything's gonna be sent out to you too as well. Um, okay, some of you are, are uh, mentioning clinicians, that's great. Okay. Let me see what else I can get to. I may be missing something. I'm just trying to look the best that I can. How does autism in, in females equate? Oh, I did miss one about romantic relationships. Let me get back up here. Um, what I can say about romantic relationships is if you go back, if you go to the resource page that you'll get in the slides, there are a few really wonderful books that touch specifically on that topic. There's one um, called Safety Skills which I think is a really fabulous book for talking about just um, general relationship dynamics. Okay. Um, how does autism and females equate with body dysmorphia and gender identity situations? Um, that's a great question. I think there's a lot for us to learn in the field about this. Um, we, as I said at the top of the presentation, since 2020, there's been a lot more, although there's been kind of rumblings in the clinical world for some time around the intersection of gender identity and autism as a whole, um, there's been much more kind of published research in the area since 2020. There was a big study that came out in 2020 kind of showing um, Again, um, individuals who identify as non-binary or transgender may be more likely to show autistic traits um, and vice versa. And we don't necessarily um, know why. It's just something that we've noticed in trying to understand um, individuals, right, and um, and such. Um, but again, what we can see anecdotally right now sometimes, again, we don't have the research to back this up, but some Non-binary individuals, um, some transgender individuals may be more likely to identify with this female phenotype of ASD compared to the classic conceptualization of autism. And I honestly don't know um, too much about body dysmorphia beyond the fact that sometimes autistic, there has been some cases of autistic females who have been first, um, they're um, Disordered eating has been detected first before their autism diagnosis. But that's kind of all I know in that area. I don't know too much about that. Okay. There is also um, another website, awnnetwork.org, that was shared at 722 in the chat if you want to bookmark that. Um, and a couple of the other books and resources here as well. Um, somebody's wondering about suicidal ideation and depression in autistic females. Yes. So when we, we look at what's been done recently, um, looking at late diagnosed females um, on the spectrum, the research has shown um, a greater tendency for depressive symptoms and that, and, and sometimes including suicidal ideation. And that makes perfect sense, right? If kind of one spends one's life feeling maybe confused or disconnected or invalidated or putting a lot of energy into fitting in, right? It would, it would make sense that some of these mental health symptoms, um, would, would present themselves, right? Um, okay. Can you comment on PDA, pathological demand avoidance? Um, that's not um, something that I have great clinical expertise in. Um, from what I understand, it kind of spans across sex and gender. Um, so that's nothing that, that's not a topic that I'll be able to speak to um, too much tonight. Great. I'm seeing a lot of other, thank you all for sharing all of these resources. This is great. So keep cutting and pasting into your, into your um, bookmarks. I'm copying the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network myself 
because I wasn't aware of that. So I'm bookmarking that as we're talking too. Um, do adult AS females have imaginary friends? Um, I don't know if there's any research on that per se, but um, that could make sense, right? If somebody's feeling isolated, if somebody um, has a tendency to love creative play, right? I could see it come out like that. Um, okay, let me read this next question here. Yeah, okay. My 17-year-old daughter um, with ASD wants to play on playgrounds, loves imaginative play. However, she's concerned that this will not be socially acceptable to play um, at her age and feels like she's she's leaving her childhood behind. How can I support her with this concern? And I hear somebody else echoing this, this sentiment. Um, just to validate this for you, this is a very common, um, this is a very common, um, theme I hear among females and their parents. Like, how do I continue to validate who I am and at the same time kind of grow in other ways and build relationships with my same age peers? Um, I would continue to help her kind of balance these two things, right? Um, give her some outlets outside of school to be able to do the imaginative play that she likes, like things like theater, right? Improv, things like that, as well as encourage her to be actively involved in her school community as well, right? It can be a both and, it doesn't have to be an either or. Okay, I'm noticing, yep, one last question, okay. I'll see, I'll gonna give us 30 seconds, see if anything else comes in, um, but I just wanna draw your attention to um, the, um, the autism competent healthcare article, um, that Sarah posted here too. Um, she said it has some helpful tools and links. So I'm going to bookmark that one myself too. Excellent. Okay. So we're just right up about at time. Thank you so much for you all, for all of your attendance and presence here today. Um, the questions were just um, so, um, so thoughtful and really helped me kind of think through my understanding of the female presentation of autism. And I just so appreciate all of the resources that you're sharing with one another. So hopefully um, we'll all be able to help each other as we move forward on this journey. So thank you all so much for your time. Um, sit tight for the recording and the additional resources. And I hope you have a very nice evening.